I, I just want to remind you that this this event is part of the uh, <coughs> humanitas professor <coughs> economic thought. Um, it was the idea for these things was Lord Weidenfeld's, and it's run by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. In Oxford, it's run in collaboration with the Department for the Division of the Humanities and All Souls College. And I'm Vince Crawford, the uh, academic director, I think is what they call me, for the economic thought professorships. <coughs> Today, uh, again, we have in the morning Professor Descupta, and in the afternoons, we have two master classes by Bob Watson, who's here and Professor John Broom, who may be here, but I've never met. There he is, John Broom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so we're hoping to have an exciting day. Um, I want to say something um, less stilted than I did yesterday. Um, and I think Partha has never been compared to a chainsaw before. But there are fame, and this is a favorable comparison. <laughs> Chainsaws, in most cases, are kind of scary, but they're also highly productive. And there's a famous McCulloch chainsaw ad from the 70s, which 7 billion people have selfishly not posted on YouTube, in which two beavers, talking beavers, watch a chainsaw do what they thought of as a day's work in a couple of minutes. And they get very upset by this. And at the end, they say to each other, well, I'll bet it can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, I think the young beavers of Cambridge and LSE and Stanford watch the young Descupta saying their analog of, I'll bet it can't swim, or I'll bet he can't swim, but, but of course, swimming wasn't that relevant, so probably they said to themselves, I'll bet he can't write a wonderful introduction to economics. Now we know that that's not true. And um, anyway, um, I want to introduce uh, an economic theorist of extraordinary range and depth and, and urge you all to, to you know, enjoy the workshop. Um, logistics, we have a couple of breaks. The breaks are going to happen in our hall, which we will lead you to. Um, and then we have, you're on your own for an hour for lunch. And then we have a break in the afternoon. And the thing should be wrapped up by about 4.30. And I think in general, the speakers want to encourage interaction. But, but I'll, let them, I'll let them decide how much interaction they want to take. But the idea is that this should be more of a dialogue than a lecture. So. Please join me in welcoming Professor Descopto again to Oxford. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I really would like to be interrupted uh, as and when. Um, I suppose mostly as uh, and when. That is to say, whenever you're moved to inter interrupt because you can't follow something, I've, or I'm talking nonsense, or it's confusing, or any combination thereof, these. Is there some way of, uh, where should I, no, my optimal position is meant me here. This is probably the right place. That works better, right? That works better, fine. Yeah, so do do that, and I hope we'll, uh, the, my idea is that it will, I have some, something like a framework, but we can take detours as questions arise, or there's some theme that you want to, um, discuss, and it's not there, well, we can do that, provided I have the competence, of course. But there will be somebody who will have the competence. It's a pretty wide-ranging group here. Now, my, this morning, I can't anticipate the afternoon's uh, lectures, but this morning what I want to do is to start from one part of yesterday's lecture, the formulation of intergenerational well-being. I want to concentrate on uh, discount the issue of discounting, social discounting, which has been much discussed in the literature. It's had a revival, and most things have revivals, by the way. Nothing's really very new, as I've discovered as I've grown old. Um, but the, the issues that I'll be discussing this morning, some aspects of them have been there since the, much discussed in the 1970s, early 70s, when I was a graduate student, um, late 60s, early 70s. And these long-term economic growth problems, or optimizing uh, 
economies, these problems of optimum economic growth, in some sense disappeared as our attraction of planning models <coughs> dwindled, I guess. But they resurfaced, uh, obviously, in recent years, owing to our interest in climate change, we're looking at the deep future. The deep in economics means a couple of hundred years, by the way. So it's, I think we're talking about thousands, millions of years, but sort of push the horizon back. And um, so what I thought I would do is to start discussing the matter. I will then um, will point out there are essentially two quite distinct philosophical uh, roots to the literature. And I know John Broom will uh, elaborate on that. He may contest it also. I don't know, but that's the whole idea is to have a discussion. Um, in a way, I'm going to try and defend everybody, which is a, a hard thing to do. But on the other hand, I can sort of see different protagonists uh, coming to the problem of climate change and the way they uh, framed it uh, with a particular viewpoint. And uh, it has caused a certain amount of irritation in them. If you read the literature since 19, uh, 2006, you will find that the, 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 the uh, temper has been a bit frayed occasionally amongst authors. Uh, I'll bring the, all this out. But I like to think that each has merit coming from somewhere with some res respectable intellectual uh, backing. I'll do that. And then I'm going to argue that, uh, uh, that the framework that has long dominated our subject, uh, it started with, I guess, the form first formal representation was in Frank Ramsey's 1928 paper. Uh, but it has gone has a long history. It has been reinterpreted, uh, as you, some of you economists will know, uh, in recent decades in uh, trying to explain economic growth in various countries, like the United States, thinking that in some sense the decentralized world is solving an intertemporal problem, uh, an optimizing problem. So that framework came back. I'm going to, argue, I'm going to suggest that there is something deeply wrong about it. Um, and there will be one particular feature which I find uh, problematic, seriously problematic with the framework. And that might explain why there has been, uh, th that problem may be the, the source of some of the irritation in the literature that we detect. I can't, be, can't swear that that's the case, but it may be. And I'm going to offer, this is work that I'm currently engaged in with uh, Eric Maskin at, now at Harvard actually, um, trying to plug, uh, plug this, that particular hole by one device, and I'll, we'll see how it proceeds. So this is, the latter part is unpublished work, so I can't swear it's all correct, but I'm uh, pretty confident it's correct. But the, uh, the calculations are not the most important aspect of it, it's the formulation, and I'll, I'll go through that and see where we go. The, the deep problem I will be that bothers me about the framework is the fact that it doesn't have a place for se the self, personhood. It sounds rather, actually it sounds rather philosophical, but there is a sense in which uh, personhood doesn't appear in the formulation that we'll be discussing the first morning, the first part of the morning. After the, after the coffee break, I'll see what we can do about introducing personhood and what it might lead to in terms of uh, our understanding of discounting. In the afternoon, we'll have uh, Bob Watson and John Broom speaking from different parts of the topic. So, okay, that's the, that's the game plan. Right. Now, the UK government has advised its departments to use a social rate of discount that declines at a piece wise way from, I think, about 4% a year to 2% a year. The exact phasing, I was told, it's sort of, but I've now forgotten, but it's approximately that. Such declining schedules are called hyperbolic, as you probably have known, hyperbolic discounting. What is their justification? More particularly, why should we discount rates be positive? Okay? So this is all bread and butter stuff. So you can go to sleep if you like. 
but I thought I ought to go through it to begin with, first five, ten minutes, and then we can go down to some reasonably middle-brow economic theory. Or when we talk about 4% or 2% discount rates, usually we have to have a numeraire. The numeraire is chosen is usually income or consumption, object, measurable objects in dollars, if you like. And uh, here amongst your consumption discount rate, I'm going to call it consumption without making a distinction between consumption and income. Um, we should make a distinction, by the way, because in second best worlds, they are not necessarily the same shadow price. So uh, we have to be careful. Um, uh, yesterday I was paying homage to Little and Merleys, but they were amongst the first to show how you really, in a second best world, you need to revalue the various bits and pieces of national income because they're at the margin, they're on that <coughs> equal value. That's why they're in second. In other words, a reflection of their being in second best. But nevertheless, let's ignore all that, or put it this way, we're going to have consumption as our discount rate, and now it's going to be consumption, not income. Because the unit of account around which rates are being considered is aggregate consumption or income, as I said, but we'll stick to consumption here. Traditionally, two arguments have been invoked to justify discounting future consumption changes at the margin at a positive rate. I want to, we are thinking of now the evaluator as being a social evaluator, okay? Somebody who's taking the long view, recognizing that the future persons matter, and uh, it's in some notion of intergenerational well-being that we are concerned with, or the person is concerned with. And the two are, uh, the one is impatience, and the other is a desire for equity in a world, equity in the distribution of consumption, by the way, uh, because that's the coin by which the analysis is conducted. Desire for equity in a world where future people are expected to be richer than us. Uh, the second one is an interesting viewpoint because, of course, if you expect people to be poorer in the future, then the reverse argument would kick in, presumably, if you're concerned with equity. And that's something I want to come back to and it, because it's going to play a big role in our understanding of discounting in the face of uncertainty, which has had a, a lot of attention in recent years, uh, recent months, over deep uncertainty about what might happen if we fall if and when we fall into some tipping points, to cross some tipping points. Um, so these are the two standard arguments. Um, philosophers hate social impatience. Here, I mean, Sidgwick is uh, 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 absolutely clear about it. It seems clear that the time at which a man exists cannot affect the value of his happiness from a universal point of view and that the interest of posterity must concern a utilitarian as much as those of his contemporaries. So it is understandable that teleological theories such as classical utilitarianism would find social impatience unacceptable. But to the extent contractual theories such as Rawls can be thought to have a clear idea of what intergenerational justice amounts to, they too would appear to dislike social impatience. Now, I, it sounds a little cryptic, the last bit of that sentence, but I have cause. I have studied Rawls' theory of uh, inter, uh, distribu distributive justice over time, quite carefully, as carefully as anybody else has done, and it's, it doesn't get off the ground. He doesn't have a theory of intergenerational justice. Um, he has words like some uh, savings principles, which savings rates, which we all would agree to, or agree with, or approve of, but that, of course, <coughs> doesn't say anything. Uh, you don't have an mechanism for. Some of us have tried it. Ken Arrow uh, had a paper in 1973 where he applied the Maximin principle to the intergenerational savings. This is a detour I'm taking now. Um, obviously, if each generation is concerned with its own consumption, then Maximin in the standard economic models will say no savings. And that doesn't look all that promising, or at least Rawls was rejected maxim in, in the intergenerational context precisely on that ground. And then introduced a very reasonable notion that parents care about their children. So it was the, in some sense, a whiff towards the, uh, the, house, the household model. Um, but the way he had framed it, and perhaps Arrow was being a bit precious on this, he took the utility function of a, gener of, of a household to be its consumption and the next generation's consumption. 
So it's a two-period utility function. And then perform the maximum on that across the generations. And that led to problems. And you can see what problems it would be. Um, in a productive economy, um, the savings rate would be intertemporally inconsistent. So each generation would like to revive, revise the, it would recompute. So that was a problem. I modeled it as a uh, uh, Nash equilibrium, intergenerational Nash equilibrium. Of course, that would be consistent. That would be one which certainly would satisfy the role says Dixon, namely that each would be willing to save according to the rate provided the others are doing. That's the definition of Nash equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, you encourage uh, interruptions. Yes, absolutely, please. Um, Yes. And I'm partly thinking about Farrow and yes. Macro. Yes. Now, if, if I care about the utility of the next generation, yes. and I know that the next generation will care about the utility of the subsequent generation, right. then you get recursion. Right. Now, is the same true with, with consumption? If it's of income, then not. Yeah. But if it's consumption, if I know the next generation will be making a bequest because they care about the consumption of the the next generation, so they say to make that, then you get the recursion. Then you do get the recursion. Is that correct? No, that's absolutely, you're quite right. But the, the way uh, Arrow framed it was U of CT plus U of CT plus one. That's it. That was the TX generation CT. But the function. effect that makes it infinite because of the chain, whereas if it was income, if it was Y of T plus one, yeah. you wouldn't go beyond the next generation. Uh, I'm not with you. Why? Uh, let's so just see. Let's, say, uh, let's have a... <coughs> Here we go. Well, maybe the intuition's wrong, but I was thinking that the um, suppose I don't care at all about potential grandchildren. Right. Um, but if I know that my children are going to care about their children and will save up yeah. to, in the interest of my grandchildren, then you will get the infinite effect. You're absolutely right about so that. But the difference between income and consumption. Right. The way, the way. Uh, Arrow defined it was a simple for the tth generation. Um, he had a discount rate, but that's not important. So the preference of the tth generation was over consumption of its own consumption and the child's consumption. That's it. That was how it was formed. But you, you right, could but have it, altruistic preferences that are defined directly over. Oh no, I, I agree. It was the, it's a literal interpretation, literal uh, formulation of the way Rawls framed the, the problem, and that was this formulation. That's 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 all. We both we both recognize that if the recursion is recursive structure is formed, then of course you're back to a standard formulation. And uh, but this is this is the form which will give you a, 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 has a problem. In productive economy, you get these rec these uh, sawtoothed consumption pattern, and therefore it's um, intertemporally inconsistent. That was a problem. Either it was a stagnant economy, or it was inter intertemporally inconsistent. But, as, but you're quite right. You can squeeze in a, a recursive property. It's just a suppose you literally is a two-period pay, payoff function for each generation. Then what? Over consumption. So, but of course, Rawls had quite a bit to say about the first point, namely impatience, and he was against it. Right. Um, <coughs> but there is an alternative approach which has been tried. Jarling Koopmans, the late Jarling Koopmans' work is of that variety. As you probably know, the idea was, in his case, what he wanted to do was to uh, consider a set of axioms on infinite Utility streams. Let me, let's suppose the utilities are the basic objects, not consumption. He, his theorems work on consumption as well, but I think we'll think of the utilities as being the raw material on which you're, you're constructing the actions. Um, this work was a generalization of um, representation theorems in utility theory by people like De Bruyne, Norman Morgenstern, and others. 
They worked on finite dimensional spaces. What uh, Koopmans did was to study infinite dimensional spaces with a time structure. So you could talk about moving forward consumption uh, utility streams. Uh, when I say moving forward, it's a bit like uh, I'm just sort of work, working around until I come to some formulation. Um, there's a f famous example in George Gamow's One, Two, Three, Infinity. I don't know if the book is ever read anymore, but it's a, still a delightful piece of work. But he had this story of an infinitely long motel and uh, a, a traveler needs a room, but there's a sign saying no vacancy. But the traveler is a mathematician. So he comes in and tells the manager that he would like a room. And he says, haven't you seen the notice? There is no vacancy. So he says, that means what? He said, well, all the rooms are taken. So he said, all right, nevertheless, I can create a room for myself. What you do is transpose every uh, occupant by one room. So person in room one moves to room two, person in room two moves to room three, and so forth. Down. And you have an empty slot in room one which is what I'd like to have. That plays a critical role in the axiomatic structure in, in Koopmanses. But the axioms themselves are not, of, to me, out of the great moment. I want to point out a, a difference between the uh, philosophical foundations of the framework of Koopmans from that of Sidgwick and Ramsey. Um, we're, uh, we're thinking of a pluralist picture. You, have several, more than one value that you wish to accommodate, and you're forced to make trade-offs. And that's the spirit in which I will do the, I will describe these. So the, the usual notation, we have in discrete time equation one in continuous time equation two, intergenerational well-being at date zero. Um, U is the uh, flow of welfare, C is consumption. I'm going to ignore now distribu a, a temporal distribution, distribution of problems, just to concentrate on the time dimension. Delta is a, the impatience rate. This is all familiar to you, but I do want you to recognize that there's an immense difference, even the formula formulation between Sidgwick, Ramsey, and Koopmans. Um, one reduces to the Sidgwick-Ramsey form if dg du is 1 and delta equal to 0. Um, the jolly koopmans says axioms lead to dg du being positive, but it's unspecified as to what g is. It's a transform of the utility function u. I'll come back to this in a minute because it might look all mysterious, but it's not. It's extremely down the line if you just remember your uh, axiomatics of de Broglie, of converting from consumption to utility, it's the same thing. If, you, if utility is your object, then you'll have a transform of utility, and that's your G function. So you mean G is undetermined, not that it's undetermined? The axioms do not specify what G is, except that it's monotone increasing. Okay. That's all that the axioms will tell you. That comes from the monotonicity assumption. But it doesn't say that G is necessarily concave, you need some more input into the axiomatic structure. A desire for equality, for example, will give you that, or will force you to acknowledge that. But the axiomatic structure doesn't tell you anything other than the fact that G is a monotone increasing function of U. And delta is positive. And of course, that's the one which has really caused that uproar in the recent literature. Um, I think uh, Professor Broom will elaborate on <coughs> the way and the, the problems with Koopmans's axioms. Um, you don't need Koopmans's axioms to get a positive delta. Peter Diamond, some years, about the time Koopmans was uh, writing on this, showed that if you have these infinite utility streams, you've got a compact set of infinite utility streams, and it's important to the, when you have, a, it's important to recognize that if you, if basically you've got a set 
of objects, and these objects are infinite dimensional, infinite strings, okay? You need to specify, like any, anywhere else, you need to specify the notion of a distance, closeness of two strings. Uh, in finite dimensional space, we don't talk about it much because it's obvious. Pretty much any way you want to think of it ends up being the same, the distance. Okay, the, straight, the distance of the straight line between the two points will be the same as many other ways of thinking about it. But for infinite horizon, infinite, infinite streams, um, it's a more delicate matter. But it's important to rep remember that the Koopmans actions took the soup to be the, the, the norm on the basis of which. So if you have two infinite sequences, and you want to say how close are they to one another? Are they similar? or they're very far away from one another. Then what you do is to look at the soup, quote unquote, max of the differences between the components. And uh, choose that to be your measure of distance. Now I mentioned this, I'm being very informal here because writing down all this would be very boring. And intuitively you can see what's going on. The reason I'm harping on the soup is that the soup doesn't say anything about when the gap occurs, the biggest gap occurs between, between two. And so in, in a deep sense, it's time neutral. And yet, uh, when you impose continuity, completeness, you get a positive discount rate. Now, it's easy to see why. If you don't, then you will, uh, you won't, they won't converge, the sums won't converge, and you get into trouble. But the positive delta is not implied by, I mean, it's not restricted to the Koopman's actions. Diamond showed that if you, if the ordering over these infinite utility streams is continuous, continuity defined through the soup distance, and it's monotone, meaning that if one dominates the other vectorially, then it's superior, then you have impatience. You cannot have neutrality across the generation. Um, completeness is probably the one which is doing a lot of work here, completeness of the, of the ordering. And that has been criticized, saying, well, I've, uh, some have even suggested that completeness is a, uh, almost an uh, indicator of in insensitivity. Uh, read the read classics, and you might think that there are choices which cannot be compared, which can't be ranked. Impossible choices, so to speak, as it were. Tragic choices, I guess. So the standard remedy for that is to use things like the overtaking criteria. Yeah. Do they also give you positive discounting? The overtaking criterion is a device to uh, overcome the non existence of an optimum, as you know, but actually it didn't have much mileage. It literally filled in. Um, um, holes which are of measure zero. It's the golden rule which got in, as it were, rather than being left out. So it, it looked very promising, but it, it has a very restrictive uh, power. Um, but the one way of interpreting the Jalin Koopmans uh, framework here would be to say that, OK, so that's been one criticism, that how can you possibly know in advance what the ordering is over such a complicated set of objects as a, even if it's a compact set of uh, infinite utility streams. And that sounds plausible, because there's just a heck of a lot of them, and they're all over the place, sort of some intersecting each other and so forth, and who are you to say that? But suppose you say, well, I don't know now how exactly I will order them, because I haven't seen the objects. I only know that I've been given the set. But if I peer very closely at them, I know I will be able to come to a judgment. Suppose you say that, just for the sake of argument. <coughs> then the Koopman's formulation doesn't look all that bad, because you see G and delta are both un unspecified in the Koopman's action. Koopmans, the actions do not say what delta should be, do not say what g should be. So 
if you don't know G and if you don't know delta, you haven't got a complete order. What you do say is that if I study very carefully what the set is, I'll be able to arrive at the G that I feel is reasonable and the delta that is reasonable. It's sort of a backward kind of argument. But at the time when I think about the act of my pluralism that I'm going for, that I have, there are certain moral judgments that I subscribe to, uh, such as, for example, continuity. That's a moral statement. You're saying if two objects are very close to each other, they will be close in my ranking, uh, and so forth. Or, the, uh, or uh, monotonicity, that if one dominates the other, why well, then I will prefer that. And then I have other things in mind. I have the quality, equity issues. But I'll come to those later. But these are the ones I care about. And then somebody says, ah, but you realize then you're forced to have a positive delta because the action says so. And you say, well, that's really tricky because I do care about, I don't like impatience. On the other hand, and then I say, um, maybe that's a trade-off I have to make if I care about the others as well. That's, that's the way to think about it. However, there's other ways of thinking. One reason we dislike positive delta, I'm now going by some of the criticism that I've read, uh, particularly in an interchange I've recently had with John Romer. I think I have circulated my response to John's paper. Um, was that it was almost like a cake-eating problem. Here we are, a bunch of us, and we're equally placed. And why should we favor one rather than the other? That sort of thing. Now, here's a tricky thing. If you have very few tools, you may have to compromise in a ethical sense because of the trade-offs. Um, in standard models, the generations aren't equally placed because of productivity of capital. You wait for a plant to grow and it grows. So there's a productivity of capital. And if that's the case, then there is a natural asymmetry in the availability of the factors that influence your being. Now, that's not to say that delta should be positive. That's not the argument. The argument is that there is an asymmetry inbuilt in this uh, intertemporal problem, which we may or may wish to take into account. Or additionally, of course, to the extent knowledge is durable, uh, later generations will have greater access to knowledge than earlier generations do. So there is another inbuilt asymmetry. So the cake sharing model is not quite appropriate for the, the intuition <coughs> I like here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, a moral philosopher, but I'm a uh, uh, moral philosopher who's somewhat economically literate and uh, perhaps more relevantly here familiar with transfinite arithmetic and set theory and yeah. like this. And I, I was puzzled. I've had a look at this paper um, because I was puzzled as to how it could derive the discount rate. And when it does so, it, it takes these infinite streams of, uh, of concern. <coughs> And uh, if you want to project them down into the reals um, and give everyone a real valued uh, result, uh, or just do it axiomatically, I think you might just assume an axiom of uh, an Archimedean axiom in order to, to achieve this. Uh, that says that there's no, uh, if you can't have a sequence of uh, in, in, uh, consumption streams, each of which gets linearly better, and then have one which is better than everything in that straight, in that sequence. Um, but intuitively, if you talk, I mean, if you ask Sidgwick about this, that's presumably what he would think. But if you had one which had um, one unit of welfare, whatever, and then death and nothing, and then you had one that had two units and then nothing, and you had one with three units and then nothing, they would be getting linearly better than each other. Mm -hmm. And then one which had uh, uh, one unit in every space um, would be better than a whole sequence. Um, so that's ruled out, that kind of thing, by projecting down into the reals. Uh, so I'm wondering how much that's just, you know, uh, the reals have that property. You could use other number systems which don't have that property, uh, which include infinite numbers. That's a very good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to it. Okay. So it, it seems like, at least, I mean, from the kind of classical utilitarian <coughs> perspective, yes. you could just say something like that. And in, in the case of ethics, there are a few papers which have been written uh, by uh, Larry Temkin, Nick Bostrom, and others uh, on infinite ethics. Uh, and looking at the ethics of infinite streams mm -hmm. uh, of utility, which is exactly this kind of thing that yeah. Lucas was looking at. And generally, there are a whole lot of paradoxes that you can uh, create, you know, based on Hilbert's total type paradoxes. 
Uh, and they, they feel more paradoxical in the case of ethics than in the case of, uh, of mathematics. Right. Because in mathematics, right. you say, well, it's a weird domain. We just, we just, our intuitions don't really apply. Yeah. But actually, you can find uh, two kind of moral intuitions you can have about these three that do conflict. And so what a moral philosopher would think, looking at this, uh, I presume, uh, or other moral philosophers, is that we take an area which is kind of known to be kind of very paradoxical uh, within ethics, and then we use that to resolve like a, a you know, heated dispute. Uh, and it feels like that's going to throw away around, uh, whereas we take this area we know very little about and we're deeply confused about, and we use that to try to prove things about something. Right. Uh, no, I think that's a very fair comment, yeah. But of course, I could, I could uh, uh, restate the Krugman's theorem by making it into a paradox by saying I also insist on equal treatment. Then you get an impossibility theorem. <coughs> uh, yeah. I'm putting it not in that form, but the form he has used because I want to just contrast it and see how. Most economists actually are not really committed to one form or the other. They like to play with the stuff and see how they pan out in plausible models. And I want to use that in a minute. Okay. But I think it's a very good point. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, Kupmatz is an impossibility result. You say, well, we won't have impatience, and then I ins insist on the Kupmatz actions, and bang, you get no representation. Right. Okay. So uh, we're going to play with, uh, we're going to work with the most common utility function, the isoelastic ones. By the way, in equation four, uh, somehow my, uh, the eaters should be not subscripts. <laughs> okay, so that's obvious. So the most common framework, I want to, uh, as I go along, I want to argue that this is a very bad move, looking at the structure of utility functions of the kind in four. G of u is now isoelastic. Iso the derivative of G of u is isoelastic. It's C raised to the power one minus eta divided by one minus eta. Uh, I'll be considering the case where eta is greater than one, or the log case where eta is equal to one. Okay? That reduces to the log case there. Because in the climate change literature, that's the one which has been much used. Now, this is a working seminar, and I, go to, I hope you'll give far, far many more interruptions. But uh, I want to point out now that I'm going to argue at the end of this morning that this is a bad specification although it's very commonly used. It's bad because it's unbounded. It's unbounded below. This one is unbounded below, bounded above, uh, at least for the eta greater than one case. Eta were less than one, it would be, which I'm not considering because nobody else has considered it in the recent literature. It'll be unbounded above, but bounded below. Now, unbounded functions create uh, paradoxes of a kind that Marty Weitzman has been writing on recently. And there's absolutely no reason for having unbounded, because unbounded utility functions, if you, if you think they're influencing behavior, would be really inconsistent with you. You wouldn't cross a street, you wouldn't do, you know, you'd be terrified of doing anything, because it, no matter how small the chance, in this case, of course, there is infinite a drop in utility. But we're going to use it because calculations are easier. There's less reason for using these functional forms, by the way, today. With computing uh, facilities so much better. But for classroom exercises, I'll continue, I'm going to continue using them. OK. It's very easy to show that the social discount rate is then equal to 5. Uh, by the social discount rate, I now mean the following. I'm asking at the margin, what is the marginal rate of uh, substitution of consumption between two adjacent periods? OK. That's it. Um, in discrete time, if rho t is the social discount rate, you get 5. And if uh, delta is small and g, which is g, is the growth rate in consumption, by the way, if that's small. Uh, this is cryptic, but the papers have all these written down, so I haven't bothered <coughs> to give you an extensive set of slides, by the way. It's in the back. Yeah. G is, uh, let's, so we are looking at a forecast. Okay, we're not optimizing or anything. We're looking at a forecast, so the uh, u depends on c, and we're choosing the class of u g u functions, which are so have this form, the raised to the power of one minus eta form. So the eta is a measure of the curvature of g of u. So you're allowed to play with it if 
you like, experiment with it, even if the U is given, because you have that degree of freedom to, to allow your notion of intergenerational equity to play a role. So we can play with ETA. But that becomes a, a single parameter, and that's one problem, by the way. You're really hamstrung, because you've got only two parameters with which you can do experiments, delta and eta. And that may look a bit too few for the kind of problem you're concerned with. But beggars can't be choosers. You're looking at a really complicated problem. You're really narrowed down. So five is your, um, is your equation. But uh, if delta is small and g is small, then five reduces to six, and that's the one that you're most familiar with. Social rate of discount of the consumption rate of interest is delta, the impatience factor, plus g times eta, and that's the second intuitive reason. So if g is positive, eta is, remember, greater than one or equal to one, then g eta is positive, and that's the equity argument kicking in, which we kicked off with uh, intuitively. And the first is delta, which is, of course, the impatience factor. Okay? Other things being equal, early consumption is better than, or more preferable to later consumption. So you have a very simple structure. And um, my reason for not having optimized to this point is that none of, well, th these arguments depends on an optimizing economy. You should be able to conduct welfare economics or do welfare economics uh, in, an, <coughs> in a world shot through with problems, corruption, you name it. Because what you do is to try and, with your understanding of the political economy of the situation, make a forecast and then perturb the forecast when you do policy analysis, but in order to, and then evaluate it. But in order to evaluate, you need an ethical framework. And we're back to what we've been discussing. Okay? Now, obviously, in an optimizing economy, this rho t will equal the rate of return on investment. I'm going to work with a very simple structure where the rate of return is constant. I've got no population here. Everything is sort of the simplest possible toy model. Uh, and now, that causes interpretive problems. So if it's a constant rate of return, then basically you've got a linear technology. All right. A production function is the rate of return times the amount of capital you've got. And I'm aggregating here. There's an interpretive problem here in the sense of what does K mean? And I've got personally got into trouble with my American colleagues because the rates of return that I used for purposes of computation were far too high uh, from the... Uh, but that's, they're far too high because most rates of return are uh, estimated on the basis of manufactured capital. Remember yesterday I was talking about various types of capital assets? Uh, so, but if you have a linear technology, you're basically saying, waving your hands as I'm doing now, and saying I've got solved a massive aggregation problem. And I've aggregated not only uh, aggregated manufactured capital, with natural capital, human capital, knowledge, the whole works, everything that matters, all the assets out there, is now one big block called capital. So then the rate of return um, becomes much smaller. And the reason is that, of course, the capital, uh, I mean, other words, capital output ratios are much higher than the capital output ratios that we are used to using by, from the normal uh, capital accounts. So for those who are not economists, you will, uh, the, the, if, you somebody, if you wake up an economist in the middle of the night and say, name me a capital output number, tell me what a capital output ratio is. Oh, four, three, five years. I mean, the unit of uh, capital output ratio is time periods, so that's five years or four years. But the work that I was describing yesterday of including other forms of capital now suggests that the cap true capital output ratios will be of the 15, 20 or so, because there's an awful lot of capital out there which are not being used, uh, which are not being recorded in our accounts, but are actually doing their stuff, especially if you take human capital into account. <laughs> I'm just warning you, sorry? The same is not true for output. Um, if we're looking at consumption goods, uh, and no, I, my guess is just the reverse in some sense, because our 
investment is overrated, no? Because we are depreciating other forms of capital assets. So there's an overstatement of our. Um, yeah. So, so I, I read this before coming today. And in the way you say that in order to justify your linear technology, you also you get rid of the residual in a sense and include all that in output. Yeah. Where is the yeah. Residual is the well, the, it's, be careful. Be careful. The residual is the rate of change of total factor productivity. And you're saying, what about total factor productivity? No, I'm wondering, total factor productivity, as you would interpret in the residual, is just of manufactured capital. So when you then say you're looking at sort of the linear production function capital, I was just imagining that you're just including, well, the whole. knowledge and everything, and therefore the fact that we can every year produce more manufactured capital, the fact that we have an increasing residual in manufactured capital, means that every year we must also be adding in terms of knowledge and uh, well, all the other sorts of capital as well. As yeah, production. that's right. That's absolutely right. Production that's, would yeah, have to be yeah, as yeah, a, yeah. As well. In other words, the product yeah. adding to the stock of capital, yeah. not just with manufacturing capital, but with other yeah. sorts of capital. Yeah. Well. That's, that's absolutely right. right. In other words, I'm arguing that uh, capital is less productive than we make it out, and the reason is that we are only looking at one bit of it. Um, right. So let's work with that now. That's the background. Illustrative figures. Uh, Bill Klein, in a 1992 book, on <coughs> called the economics of uh, global warming. I think it's, it was called. Is that right? That was. I think it was. Or is it the climate, uh, economics of global warming? I think. Took delta to be zero, eta to be 1.5. Bill Nordhaus, in his work, 1994 book, took delta to be three percent a year. He didn't derive that delta from, from uh, Hoopmans' actions, by the way. He was doing reveal preference analysis. Uh, we'll come back to that if we have time. Eta equal to 1. Nick Stern, as you know, took delta to be 0.01% a year, and eta equal to 1. The point estimate of consumption growth under business as usual in Stern was given as 1.3% a year, using this in equation 6, the previous equation, the one that gives you the social rate of uh, Discount, that is consumption rate of interest, as 2.05% a year for Klein, 1.4% a year for Stern, and for Nordhaus, 4.3%. And that, to an extent, gives the um, reason as to why Klein was very much for urgent action, as was Stern subsequently. And, uh, but Nordhaus wasn't. The, the payoffs from investment in climate change coming in the distant future were discounted at a higher rate by Nordhaus, and so they looked less urgent. That's the idea. Now, the reason why doing work in this field is uh, you have to cut corners and be willing to acknowledge that whatever you do is, has a problem. There's nothing clean about it. Is this. Um, so suppose your production function, your rate of return is R. Okay, I'm going to do a quick calculation with you, uh, which is in the paper, but I think I want to do it with you here in order to make it clear why some of us have felt, uh, at least I feel more comfortable with the Koopmans framework because it gives me some leeway to take into account other considerations which might be missed out if you straightjacket the model in advance by taking delta equal to zero. So at an optimum, for an optimum, rho t equal to e to the r, all right? That's clear, because you would wish to choose that program along which the rate, social rate of di discount equals the rate of return, because otherwise you could make an improvement by uh, going to a neighboring uh, assumption in the usual uh, variational kind of argument. All right, now the, this equation, let me just see. Uh, sixth equation tells us the G, therefore, optimum, optimum G now is equal to R minus delta upon eta. Because for, in this equation here, for rho write R, because that's the optimality condition, and then rearrange it so your G is equal to R minus uh, delta upon eta. And we know that the optimum savings rate 
Uh, this is, we know there's going to be a constant savings rate because the utility function is homothetic, uh, it's linear uh, technology, so uh, scale doesn't matter. All right. Your ratios are going to be constant, independent of scale. So you're going to, have, going to have a constant savings rate, and that's going to be R minus delta divided by eta R. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Well, now look, if your delta is zero, then an eta is approximately one, you've got a huge savings rate. And that's the kind of thing that bothers me a little bit. It's a toy model, admittedly, it's a special kind of a world, but when you do this kind of exercise, you should cover your tracks and not be vulnerable to serious problems. So delta is zero, you've got our cancers is one upon eta, um, is, you always you need to learn from masters. Um, Ken Arrow pointed out that this equation was known to Ramsey. The fact that s is equal to one upon eta in the case where delta is equal to zero. Uh, apparently it is. I haven't tracked it, but probably it is the case. So if eta is <coughs> greater than one, well, how great could it be? Bill Klein very, very nicely, in a correspondence with me some years ago, showed me how to think about eta by looking at, uh, by asking the question, how much of income would you be willing to remove from somebody who's very rich to somebody, uh, to give to the very poor with a constant eta? And the examples, and I have them in my paper, you will see, you really can't choose eta anything you like. If you go to three or four, you really are committed to making some really weird statements regarding interpersonal transfer. So you're hemmed in by that. Okay. So you can see where the problems are. There are, uh, if you want to do this kind of work, you really have to consider so many things at one go, you're going to come up with a specification which will look uncomfortable to everybody. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah. Get some estimate of savings rates of like 97%. Yeah, it's like this one. But that savings rate again out of capital that includes the absolute non rival knowledge capital and all sorts of things. Right. So manufacturing capital is the 20th of that, let's say. Yeah. And 97% savings rate, we don't need to save 20% of manufacturing capital, which at the end of the day is um, well, 2% out of 5%, or whatever. So, so are you saying it's still it's very high consumption? No, it's, it's a 40% 40 40 savings rate or something like what I'm saying is that this is a savings rate out of a capital good, right. over which we have no right. intuition. Right. Right. You're saying savings rate is something we all know about because it's what, very, very, what we put away good. in terms of the GDP consumption rate. Sure. Whereas you're taking consumption away from a capital good over which a large proportion is a lot of very non-rival stuff that will continue to exist for production factors tomorrow even if we consume a lot of the manufacturing goods today. Right? Right. Right. So the, the fact that the savings rate here is so ludicrously large, yeah. like 9.9%. Nine nine well, I have to vary the parameter to a few hundred percent. Right? Oh, so, but it depends on how much of the capital good is really the manufactured capital good over which we have an intuition as to what the savings You're absolutely right. You're quite right. Yeah. But the intuition is going to be if from savings, you then go to consumption. And I can, the choice of eta near one squeezes consumption down to zero. As a, yeah. And you can come as close as you like. So you're right. The, as I say, what I'm trying to do here is to show you why one might, without, one might, if you think about it, allow for specifications which might, on face of it, look odd, namely a positive delta. Just all this to you know, justify, because you're going to get, I'm sure, from, uh, from John, an account of why delta really should not be positive. I'm trying to give it as much of a pr practical. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, if I get to consider the case of uh, no growth of in, in consumption or. Sorry? Are you going to consider the case of no growth in consumption or negative growth in consumption? Yes, in a minute, I'll do that. Right. Okay. So, since Avner's asked, I'm going to now spend the next two minutes or so discussing the no-growth case. We're coming near to the end of the first part. Oh, let me, let me do that. 
Right. So here's the problem. We have a problem of the following sort. 0 to infinity, e to the minus, in continuous time, uh, u of ct t. And I'm going to write the accumulation equation as r k t minus c t. OK? Now, the specification that I had given is one where consum optimum consumption is actually increasing. All right. So, but the question is, what about the possibility of declining? Could that come out of an optimization exercise? This is the problem we've just now solved right? um, with, with the isoelastic specification. But suppose R is random. It's a stoch follows a stochastic process. IID standard. Let's kick off with the IID case. So it's independently, identically distributed. Um, you need some more structure to be able to say something very serious, but uh, one would be that it's Gaussian. OK. Then it turns out, of course, you're then trying to maximize something like the expected value. And you put a uh, triple there to show that future consumption is going to be random because uncertain because you don't know what the realization of R is going to be. So that's the specification. Now, suppose R is the case that's been studied a long time ago by Lavari and Srinivasan was where R, uh, 1 plus R was log normal. Okay. So R being minus 1 means essentially the capital asset disappears. Well, can it? Some, some disaster takes place. Of course, the probability of that happening is zero, but nevertheless. Right. Well, then in that case, the solution to it is going to be one where you save a little more because of risk aversion. Eta is greater than, uh, is greater than zero, so you can do that. And we can get nice certainty equivalence results. The interesting case that's been studied recently is, when, is the case where R is positively correlated. Serial correlation is positive. So the probability of it being a high R today is higher if it was a high R yesterday than if it was a low R. In that case, the certainty equivalent discount rate turns out to be uh, of the uh, hyperbolic type. That's, so you can get now a uh, full interpretation of how to think about hyperbolic. It comes out of a non-hyperbolic formulation, but is cropping up because of this. Now, one final remark, which is that, and this is to say that the specification we've been using, which is the, eta, the unbounded eta v function, can cause problems. Because um, um, if the tail of the distribution, i.e. the distribution the probability of your getting to very low consumption is high, high-ish, then Abner's point kicks in because there is a chance, no matter what you do, uh, you're going to get into the low R case, a repeated low R case, making consumption go down. But of course, the utility of that is very large. And the dismal theorem, which, uh, uh, of which, which uh, Weizmann has been writing about, is essentially this exercise I've just rubbed out. Because it's saying that if there is a chance that we're going to have, we're going to fall into that hole of a sequence of low uh, R such that the capital dwindles, um, well, then we have consumption is going to be perforce very low. And that's extremely bad news, no matter what your delta is. Because for any choice of delta, I can look at a whole bunch of sample parts which are going to get me into that hole. That's really bad news. I need to protect myself against that by doing what? High savings. And so that silly example I've just now given you with 100% savings rates, which means, of course, you don't consume, which is the worst thing that can happen, is another way of saying there is no answer to the question what's the best thing to do, is reappearing because of that uncertainty. So what's the answer? The answer is, well, of course, you don't, shouldn't be working with the unbounded utility. 
unbounded the field function, unbounded below means you're, you're in a pathological state of mind. You can't cross the street, you can't do anything, because there's always some chance that you're going to get hit. And if, no matter how small that chance, uh, you won't do that. So uh, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is if you are knowing Morgenstern actions, then they're of course going to be bound to be totally functions. But that's not perhaps a great reason. I think, or maybe you want to use, invoke many types of reasoning to see, show why you should have a bounded utility function, in which case, of course, the non-existence problem disappears. No matter how thick your lower tail is, existence will not be a problem. Existence of an optimum won't be a problem. Okay. Um, so that's the setup. On the other hand, a bounded utility function means you can't use isoelastic Martin utility. You've lost that facility of classroom exercises. And perhaps the time has come when we move out of, because we are, we are causing, we are creating intellectual difficulties by short circuiting something else. And once we recognize that, I think we'll move away. <coughs>